If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a bullet. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest installment of Real History. I am your host, Jared Frederick, and once again we are going to be taking a look at some instances of history versus Hollywood. And tonight we have the Mel Gibson 2016 war drama, Hacksaw Ridge. This is a film that a lot of you have been asking for and have been discussing for some time now, and as we always do here on Real History, we're going to be doing our utmost to separate fact from fiction. So. Let's go ahead and begin. Take a look at Hacksaw Ridge. In conveying the true life story of World War II medic Desmond Doss, uh, Hacksaw Ridge is very well known for pulling no punches in regard to its violence. And you really get a sense of this from the very outset of the film. There's just this this symphony of, of gruesome bloodshed uh, that, that consumes the visitor almost, or the viewer almost from a, a first person perspective uh, here at the very beginning. And it's uh, indeed some very grim prognostication of uh, what awaits audience members in the forthcoming scenes. You boys wouldn't recognize it now. Tom Doss, the father, was indeed a, a troubled individual. Uh, he, alcoholism did get the best of him uh, in, in these years preceding uh, the Second World War. Uh, although there's no indication that he was abusive or indifferent, as he is often depicted in, in some of these scenes throughout the film. Uh, so undoubtedly some liberty taken here to add a, a, an additional degree of, of tension between the characters. I'll phone an ambulance. Oh, no time. Joshua, pick up. Quick. Okay. Desmond Doss's sister often recalled that her, her brother was always the very helpful type, the good Samaritan type. Uh, whenever there was word of a car accident or a flash flood or somebody who was in need of assistance. It always seemed like her brother was there. And there was even one instance uh, where there was a call for blood uh, that was going out in the community. And Desmond walked three miles to the hospital in order to donate blood, walked back home. Uh, and then the call went out again that more blood was needed. And he once again walked the three miles to donate his blood. And so uh, even in his days prior to military service, uh, he was very much this civic-minded member of the community. He brought biblical morality to his world outlook, and he was constantly looking to help others in need. Uh, and that is a persistent theme throughout his life, as well as the film. I'm just here to take blood. I'll give you mine. Okay. I go to that room over there and wait with the others. Desmond's wife, Dorothy, was actually uh, born in Philadelphia. She was not a, a Virginian uh, by birth as Desmond was, uh, nor was she a nurse during this time either. In fact, the two of them had met uh, at his church. Desmond was, of course, a, a well-known, uh, after the war, of course, a, a Seventh-day Adventist, of which pacifism is a key principle. Uh, but, you know, this idea that, uh, you know, he goes to donate his blood here at the hospital because he wants to meet her, it, it, it simply did not happen like that. Dorothy later does become a nurse. Uh, but the circumstances as to why she is compelled to do so are a little bit more tragic than what this film would indicate. <laughs> you need to watch where you're going. One area where I'll give this film credit is its recreation of the home front here in Virginia. And um, a number of years ago, I, I visited uh, Lynchburg, Virginia. And uh, some of the townspeople were certain uh, that parts of the movie had actually 
been filmed there. Uh, but this movie was filmed entirely in Australia, and so they did some really good set decorating in these uh, various streetscape scenes. Uh, if you ever have the chance to visit uh, this community in Virginia, uh, as I said, it's just a really cool place. It has a really you know, nice ambience, and uh, it's a little wonder that Desmond Doss was rather sentimental about it during the war years. It was lucky he was dead, so he never knew how awful his uniform looked. I've, I've been really curious about Desmond's dad, and he's, he's simply known in the movie as Tom Doss. His full name, though, in real life was William Thomas Doss. And although I haven't yet been able to determine what outfit he served in during World War I, uh, he, he did, in fact, serve in World War I, and he also registered for the draft in 1942, despite the fact that he was, you know, around 50 years old. Doing everybody else. Like everybody else jumps in, does things quick without thinking like the damn idiot fools we were. It's very intriguing to ponder whether or not his dad was this disoriented and phased by his experiences in World War I. Um, in actuality, there, there's a photo of Desmond and his dad uh, standing in uniform together. Uh, and so, you know, he, he does in fact still have his old uniform. He did break it out on a few occasions, at least for a photo opportunity uh, with his son. So does that suggest that he was disgruntled, perhaps suffering from uh, uh, post-traumatic trauma. Uh, that is yet to be seen. Lady, please, step uh, away from the bus. I almost forgot. Do I need a crowbar? Here. I want you to have this. It's mine. The film skips over and condenses a lot of things, as historical movies uh, often do. Uh, in reality, Desmond enlisted in the U.S. Army in April of 1942. So just to put that into context, you know, that's only five months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. And so he's joining up fairly early on. It's not like he's joining up in the beginning of 1944. And the movie suggests that, you know, people were already enlisting and he was kind of behind the ball uh, in contrast to everybody else. And that just wasn't necessarily the case. The other thing worth mentioning that, that's completely omitted from the film is that Desmond was working in the naval yards at Newport News, which was a major point of uh, industry and shipbuilding and troop mobilization during the war. And uh, he was working as a, a ship joiner in that very, very busy shipyard. Uh, and so, in a way, he was already contributing to the war effort, uh, even before he formally joined the United States Army. I'm just joking. I'm just... That Smitty over there whipping his NC's ass. Like you were doing any better, Chowderhead? Hey, I didn't want to embarrass you. I have very mixed feelings about these scenes in the barracks at, at Fort Jackson. Uh, because, you know, one half of me thinks, my God, like, this has every war movie cliche. It's like a walking cliche, this scene is. You know, you have the tough guy from Brooklyn, you have the guy looking at the dirty magazines, you, guy, you have the guy who is a, a narcissist, uh, you know, you have the, the quiet Bible type, which Desmond is. And, uh, but, you know, on the other hand, when you look at accounts of World War II training in barracks like this at Fort Jackson, it really was a melting pot. That was something that GIs constantly wrote about. Uh, that they would talk to some of their bunkmates who they couldn't understand because they had never heard accents like that before. And so maybe there's some truth behind some of these cliches after all. No, sir. Are you contradicting me? You wagon burning son of a bitch! No, Sergeant! Let me see your Indian war cry, son! I, I don't... I can't help but think of dodgeball when I see <laughs> Vince Vaughn. Here, I, I just, like, picture him, like, throwing a wrench at somebody, saying, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. <laughs> that would have been great. 
Can you carry your weight? Yes, Sergeant. Should be easy for you then. Corporal. Sergeant. Make sure you keep this man away from strong winds. Yes, Sergeant. Fort Jackson uh, was and still is one of the largest basic training centers for the United States Army. It's located right outside of Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, although he's a bit camera shy at the moment, our producer, Andy, wanted you all to know that this is where he, in fact, did basic training in 2007. And he marched right by these barracks every morning when he was on PT. And so uh, this is uh, an environment, a setting uh, that is very well known to our beloved producer, Andy. Very good, Tex. Keep struggling, Teach. Have you ever roped a goat, Hollywood? Yeah, this movie falls into the same sort of trap that Fury does as well. You know, a lot of these guys are just too old. Uh, they're in their 30s. Vince Vaughn is in his 40s. They're just too old. A lot of these guys should be 10 or 20 years younger than what they are depicted as here. Uh, and so that, that is a repetitive problem that we see in war movies. Get behind your ears. Let's go. Move. Some have claimed that uh, Vince Vaughn's character of Sergeant Howe is, is a real person. I haven't yet been able to fully verify that, though. And one of the problems is, is that his first name, uh, I don't believe, is, is ever given. Uh, nor is it listed in any of the, the film credits or, or anything like that. And so... Was he a real guy? Was his name just forgotten or lost in the historical record? Uh, is he a composite character? It's not entirely certain. You're a conscientious objector and you joined the army. I'm a conscientious cooperator. Captain Jack Glover, portrayed here by Sam Worthington, uh, was in fact a real person. The captain's name was Jack Glover. And uh, somewhat similar as to what we see here in, in, in the film is that Glover did try to get him kicked out of the company. He thought that this guy was a nuisance. The word had spread that this was a guy who didn't want to pick up a rifle. And ultimately, Glover just wanted Desmond Doss to be somebody else's problem. Uh, he will be changing his tune, though, uh, eventually down the road, as we will be seeing in the film later on. He will not even deign to touch a weapon. You see, Private Doss is a conscientious objector. Desmond Doss did not particularly like the term conscientious objector. Uh, he preferred to frame himself as a conscientious cooperator because this was a man who wanted to serve, but he did not want to inflict violence on others. He wanted to use medical training to advance a, a humanitarian cause, as it was in his mind. Uh, and so uh, objector was something that he was very much opposed to, the, the phrasing as such. Yeah, see, I don't think this is a question of religion, fellas. I think this is cowardice. Plain and simple. This manner of bullying and intimidation that we see Doss going through certainly did happen to an extent. Um, a lot of the, the men called him Holy Joe. They mocked his religion. Uh, you know, he would pray out loud at night. They would throw things at him as, you know, they were all trying to, to get to sleep and whatnot. Uh, but in all likelihood, he did not go through the, the full metal jacket style of uh, bullying and brutality as his character uh, often has uh, inflicted here in the film. Uh, but suffice it to say, he did go through some verbal harassment, if not physical harassment. I won't touch a rifle, sir. I'm not asking you, Private! That is a direct order from a company commander! In this altercation with the officer, over the rifle. A version of that actually happened, but eventually another officer intervened. The commander relented. Doss got his pass, and it wasn't to go to his wedding because he was already married. <laughs> and it would have been really difficult to get from Columbia, South Carolina to Lynchburg, Virginia in an afternoon. <laughs> I'm so very sorry. 
Sometimes men just get cold feet. Not my Desmond. The, the real reason why Doss was looking forward to a pass is because he wanted to meet up with his brother Harold, who was about to go overseas as a member of the United States Navy. Uh, and so that was, that was the real you know, point of tension here. Not that he wouldn't get to marry his wife, but he wouldn't get to see his brother before he ultimately shipped out. And he did, in fact, get to say farewell to his brother. This is a hearing into the matter of Private Desmond Doss. The charge is disobeying a series of direct orders from his commanding officer. How says the defendant? Unlike what we see in the film, the, the proceedings did not advance the whole way to a, a court martial. Court martials are reserved for these incredibly serious offenses, you know, uh, rapes, murders, uh, desertion in the face of the enemy, being late for a latrine inspection. Stand before me at attention. Um, not because you want a different job in, in the army. Uh, and so what his commander did in actuality as a form of punishment is that he repetitively denied Doss leave. You know, he, he wouldn't get any weekend passes. He couldn't get a furlough to, to go visit his wife or his family or his brother or anything like that. Uh, and so this is all very much hyped up here um, in the movie. Um, and, you know, it's... You know, with so many of Mel Gibson's movies having these religious overtones, it, you know, it, it's like the equivalent of Christ going before Pontius Pilate here. You know, he's being crucified for his faith. Um, and it's, it's very much exaggerated. That's a great war uniform. It is, sir. So I need to show you this. William Thomas Doss did, in fact, do a good bit of letter writing on behalf of his son, uh, but he did not write to his former commander from the First World War. He actually wrote to the chairman of his church's War Service Commission, which was headquartered in Washington, D.C. That chairman tried then to get in touch with Doss's regimental commander, essentially saying, hey, you know, there's civilians who are aware that you're being persecutorial about this guy, how about you let up a little bit? Uh, and so that sort of outside intervention was one of the determining factors that finally gets Desmond Doss the leave that he was looking for. Uncle Sam is mine. <laughs> we just took a big jump chronologically here because you really get the impression from from this time lapse that Doss's outfit, which was the 307th Infantry Regiment and the 77th Infantry Division, also known as the Statue of Liberty Division, the emblem that was on the, the patch on their left sleeve, uh, you know, they're thrown right into the, the carnage of Okinawa, which was a, a, a horrific battle in the Pacific, which claimed perhaps over 200,000 lives on both sides. But in actuality, this division fought in both Guam and Leyte, which is in the Philippines. Uh, and so the 77th was a fairly battle-hardened division by this point. But the impression that the film gives is that there are a bunch of rookies being thrown here, you know, in the ninth inning, so to speak. Uh, you know, to help bring about the, the final collapse of the Japanese Empire. So it, it's a little bit misleading here in this regard. Captain Glover. Lieutenant Manville, 96th. We've been assigned to you, sir. The reference to the 96th Infantry Division here is, is a good one. It's a historically accurate one. And the 96th had been sent to the, the Maida Escarpment, as it was known, a later to be nicknamed Hacksaw Ridge. And they were indeed chewed up rather harshly here before the 77th was sent in. Move out! If, if you go to visit Hacksaw Ridge yourself after seeing this movie, you may be a little bit disappointed by what you see because uh, the movie greatly exaggerates the scale of it. 
Now, the escarpment as a whole uh, is, is almost, uh, it's like a series of, of steps. Uh, and then there is a, a steeper cliff toward the very top of it. Uh, the portion of that top cliff, the, the very crown of the escarpment, might be 30 or 40 feet. It, it's still really imposing if you're in a combat situation. Um, but what we see here in the movie is just so, so much larger uh, than, than what it is in reality. And ironically, and perhaps appropriately enough, uh, this ridgeline is actually a park-like setting. It, it's very lush, it's very green, uh, there's, you know, uh, uh, benches and a scenic over, uh, overlook at the very, very top. Uh, and so it, 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 today, it, it, it is very much, you know, grown over um, in contrast to the desolate landscape that we see here. Something they did get right here, though, uh, is that we see these amphibious cargo nets draped down the side, and that is, in fact, what they used to scale this cliff. I'm not entirely certain what sort of spatial limitations they had here on top of the ridgeline, but this is about as poor a tactical formation as one could, could see. Um, how dozens upon dozens of people are bunched together here, uh, amassing their forces together, making ideal targets, the very sort of targets that the Japanese would have savored. Uh, and I highly suspect that the men of the 77th very much would have learned their lesson by this point in the war, not to bunch up in the manner such as we see here. So just a little bit of a recap here as to the significance of Okinawa. This would be one of the, the final islands to be captured in the well-known island hopping campaigns of the Pacific. And the whole premise of the island hopping campaigns is usually these islands that were sought after uh, included airstrips. And the U.S. military needed those airstrips so they could inch their way ever and ever closer to the Japanese mainland to bomb them into oblivion. This island is only about 340 miles away from the Japanese mainland, and it's no wonder that the Japanese would fight so fiercely for it. I absolutely hate this scene. I, I hate this scene, okay? A Browning automatic rifle weighs around 25 pounds. It's a, a very heavy, hefty weapon. It, it's pretty much physically impossible to shoot it one-handed while you're also carrying the corpse of a fellow comrade. Not that they would have done that either. I, I, I think of that scene as incredibly heinous, overkill, theatrical liberty bullshit. Uh, I can't think of a single account like that where someone would actually do that to one of their deceased, decapitated comrades. Now, all that said, men on Hacksaw Ridge took cover behind the bodies of fallen soldiers. But doing that on the ground is something very, very different from picking up a corpse while you're shooting one-handed with a nearly 30 pound weapon. Uh, what a bunch of horse crap. <laughs> a priority, you ever heard of triage? He'll be dead before we get him down. You don't know that! Get him down! It would have been so hard to keep somebody with both of their legs blown off alive in circumstances like this. Uh, chances are they would have bled out before uh, even Desmond Doss could have lowered them back down the ridge. Despite my many qualms with this movie, I really do enjoy Andrew Garfield's performance. He, he looks the part, he acts the part, and then there's these other aspects where he's just really limber on his feet, he's running everywhere, and it perfectly fits some of the first-hand testimony and description that his fellow soldiers wrote about. I got him! Get ahead! Ah! Yeah, yeah, I see him too! Push in as close as you can! Give him everything you got! 
I'll send in a weapons team to flank them. And then once again, you know, here those little technical details, you know, you have somebody on a field phone communicating with somebody using a handy talkie. Those two systems are not compatible with one another. Uh, and so, you know, it, all these little things, they add up on, you know, whether or not a film is realistic. <laughs> On another technical point, uh, the, the machine gun that Vince Vaughn's character is using, uh, it's known as a grease gun, and that was a weapon that was a, a cheaper alternative to the Thompson. And you know, that, that fully was uh, you know, emblematic of America's sort of a, a quantity over quality method and how they were going to win the war. Uh, the grease gun only cost about 15 bucks to produce uh, by 1945, whereas the, its equivalent, the Thompson submachine gun, cost around $70 to produce by this point in the war. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think his character is the only one that uses one in the movie here, so it's notable to point out. And I love that shot with the camera panning backward as the, the two lines of men clash into each other. Uh, one, one of the great cinematic merits of, of this film is its, its cinematography. There's some really some, some top-notch cinematography in this film. People pulling grenade pins with their teeth. Another 1940s war movie cliche. <laughs> Guys on the verge of death and you're still calling them goal. <laughs> Good job, man. Good work. Dig in for the night. We hold this spot. We mop up the rest of the ridge tomorrow. One of the things that made the Mida escarpment so lethal, uh, and uh, Doss himself attested to this later in life, is that they had been there for years, uh, much like Iwo Jima, which had been waged just a few months prior to this. Uh, the whole place was honeycombed with, with bunkers, trenches, tunnels, nasty booby traps that were uh, left for the American invaders. The Japanese knew this terrain. They knew how to capture and uh, kind of stick Americans into a, a bottleneck situation, tactically speaking. Uh, and that's why you just have these overwhelming numbers of casualties like we see depicted here. <laughs> The, the altercation that we just saw between the, the father and the mother where a pistol is drawn, uh, this too deviates from some of the, the real history. Uh, in actuality, Desmond's dad got into a, a physical brawl with his brother-in-law, and the wife interceded. The, the fight was not between the husband and the wife. And that was a scarring moment for Desmond Doss. And that was also perhaps the moment where he decided that he could not lift his hand uh, violently, you know, against another human being. Uh, and so that, that fight between his uncle and his dad left a lasting imprint on him. Here, they, they went to the Captain Miller skull of mortar tossing. Man, it's one, one thing to detonate a mortar off of a mortar base plate, but to do it off your helmet is a whole other level of unrealistic insanity. Oh, and the one that that guy was throwing had no primer in it, so it wouldn't have detonated anyway. There is, of course, a photo of Desmond Doss standing atop the ridge. Uh, things look a little bit more chill in that one scene than uh, what we see here uh, in this particular moment in the film, which suggests that, you know, that there were interim pauses um, in the fighting, you know, when he had the opportunity to, to stand there at the top without the immediate worry of, of, of getting shot. Um, we don't have so much that sort of breather here with this film.
emergency is the mother of invention. Uh, and, you know, the, at first, you know, the rope wasn't long enough, but, you know, DOS was able to jury rig uh, some sort of a harness in which people could uh, be lowered. And that was part of the miraculous component of his story. Probably doubtful the Japanese would have thrown a grenade into one of their own tunnels. <laughs> it's certainly in the realm of possibility that DOS did care for wounded enemy combatants as he was conducting his missions of mercy. Uh, he never really attested to that himself, but Americans who were later surveying the scene seeing uh, dead and wounded Japanese soldiers said that some of them had American bandages on them. Um, so suffice it to say, there were not many American medics running around on Hacksaw Ridge who were applying tourniquets to wounded Japanese. And therefore, merely by process of elimination, we could assume that it was probably Desmond Doss who was doing that. Either that or the Japanese were taking medical kits off of dead Americans, which was also a possibility. Uh, true to life, as we see here in this sequence, uh, Doss, he, he wouldn't go down. He wouldn't go down the ridge. Uh, when he was later asked why he, you know, didn't take a breather, why he didn't, you know, go down the, the ridge himself, you know, he simply said, these men were my buddies. They, they trained with me, you know. I had gone through battle with them before. I couldn't leave them behind. Um, and so beyond this sort of good Samaritan religious conviction, it's just that sense of brotherhood that prevails in these desperate times of combat. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a bullet. <laughs> it would have been so difficult to do. <laughs> Private Doss to finish praying for us, sir. Private Doss is praying for you. Who the hell is Private Doss? Uh, the part with uh, the attack being temporarily paused on the morning of May 5th, 1945 did actually happen. The men did give some time for DOS to pray. Um, and it was not only because they had an admiration for him and wanted to uh, give him a moment of prayer, not only on his behalf, but on behalf of all of them, but it was because he was one of the few medics that was left at this point. Uh, and so they were certainly willing to give him a moment of quiet reflection before they went for this one final push to hopefully drive the Japanese from the ridge line. And one of the, the stories is Doss did in fact kick a grenade uh, that had been thrown at him. Uh, you know, and it's the same time, around this same time, uh, that, that he actually saves uh, Captain Glover, uh, the man who tried to have him booted out of the company um, on, on the previous occasion. And Glover was of the mind. He, he said, Doss was the bravest man I knew, and he most definitely regretted uh, what he had tried to do to Doss. Uh, earlier on. Desmond. And they did retrieve his Bible, but at a later time, I believe after he had been evacuated. Something else that the film simplifies and leaves out is that after Doss had been put on a stretcher, um, it like it all it almost you know transcends the the realm of belief, but after he was placed on a stretcher and he was there on the precipice of of the cliff, uh, he still continued to take care of people even though he himself had been wounded. And while he was doing that, a bullet fired by a Japanese sniper shattered his left arm. Um, and so he was even in worse off condition than what we actually see him here in these final scenes uh, on, on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. 
Doss couldn't keep track of how many men he saved. He estimated around 50. Uh, superiors claimed 100, and so they picked a number right in the middle, and they said he saved 75 men. I just kept praying, Lord, please help me get one more. When I got this, I said, Lord, please help me get one more. The bit of uh, real-life film that we see of Desmond Doss at, at the end of the movie is from a documentary entitled The Conscientious Objector, uh, which is a really fine documentary if you're interested in learning more about the, the life of, of the real man. Uh, so be sure to check that out. So the, the, the film the, leaves us on this, this very, you know, happy, transcendent, inspirational note, and in many ways, rightly so. Uh, but it, it, as many war movies do, it, it overlooks some of the profound difficulties that Desmond Doss confronted in the post-war years. He contracted tuberculosis uh, during the war, uh, that, uh, the, the ramifications of that afflicted him for long after. Uh, he had a rather hellish time in the VA system as he was trying to rehabilitate, get back to a functioning capacity in society. And it was during that time, due to the fact that he was uh, largely incapacitated and wasn't able to do work, that his wife decided to become a nurse. And so she actually became a nurse, not before the war or during the war, as we see in the film, but rather after the war because the Doss family needed income. Uh, and so that's ultimately what motivated her to, to pursue all of that. Um, and uh, sadly, you know, a, a number of, of years later, um, Dorothy was killed in a car crash as Desmond was driving her to the hospital. And so he, he became a widower, married again a, a few years later. Um, but you, you can only imagine that that probably weighed heavily on his soul as well. Uh, for a number of years, he, he was deaf uh, and, you know, and had uh, some sort of procedure where he was able to regain part of his hearing. Uh, but he, he went through a lot of really dark and difficult days uh, after the war. Uh, something else that we also see that's rather interesting in the coda of the film, um, we see some black and white footage of him embracing uh, you know, some of his fellow veterans. And that was actually taken from an episode of the popular program that ran through the, the 1950s and the 1960s called This Is Your Life. Uh, and so that is available in its entirety on YouTube. And if you want to hear Desmond Doss, as he probably uh, a little bit more so sounded as he was during wartime, uh, that's a very interesting primary source to take a look at as he reunites with some of his comrades from the Second World War. Hollywood is a very powerful thing in conveying history. I teach a class on World War II in the Pacific, and when I get to the Battle of Okinawa, a lot of students perk up a little bit because there's an anticipation that I will be talking about Desmond Doss's heroics. And I do talk about Desmond Doss, but I talk about dozens of other people as well who also, you know, arose to the occasion and performed gallantly and had to overcome all sorts of moral obstacles and complexities on that horrible island as well. But students don't know the names of those other people. They only know the names of the people who are depicted in movies, and that's the power of movies. However, if I can use Desmond Doss's story as a platform for giving students a broader understanding of other incidents that took place on Okinawa, uh, then it's certainly a, a useful platform and it's one that I most definitely try to use wherever possible. Ultimately, you can't argue with the fact that Hacksaw Ridge is a compelling story. There's an inspirational, true life figure behind all of it, one that has come to, to serve as a means of inspiration even into the present era. And despite the compelling story, there are 
Uh, parts of the film that I find disappointing or underwhelming from a historical perspective. Uh, I can't quite help but re I can't remove myself from the idea that it, it's a somewhat campy Hollywood depiction. There's a lot of little technical things that I think detract from the realism throughout the film. And I think uh, some of the, the bloodshed is especially uh, gratuitous and uh, almost cartoonish uh, to, to a broad extent. Uh, and certainly the Battle of Okinawa was a, a rather uh, bloody affair, uh, but it, it's, it's almost you know, to the point of overpowering um, in this film and also at times rather unrealistic, just going by the, the accounts that I've read, the footage that I've seen and other veterans that I've spoken to. But don't take my word for it. Do a little bit of digging yourself, do a little bit of research, uh, and you can draw your conclusion to see if you think the movie Hacksaw Ridge is accurate or not. And as always, that is the demand that I leave to you as we finish up here. As you are wondering about the power of Hollywood in history, uh, we are on the verge of unveiling our Real History website, and most assuredly, you'll be able to find some really good historical content, especially valuable for classroom use. So stay in tune on that front as well. As I often do at the end of our episodes, I encourage you all to check out or buy some books on the topics that we explore. And I'm going to revisit one that we mentioned during our episodes of the Pacific, and that is Ian Toll's Twilight of the Gods, which looks at the war in the South Pacific in 1944 and 1945. This is the final volume of a masterful trilogy which Toll authored, uh, and this book extensively covers the Battle of Okinawa, uh, and it excels at both the small picture and the big picture at the same time. So there's a lot of books that you can check out. If you're looking for a holistic view, though, on the Pacific War, you can't go wrong with Ian Toll. That wraps up this episode of Real History. We thank you once again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.